Hello, everyone, and welcome to this NextFlow and NFCore online community training event. My name is Chris, and I'm a developer advocate for Secure Labs, and I'll be presenting the training material over the next four sessions. As a part of this training event, other presenters will be presenting the same content in one of five different languages. Um, so I'll be presenting in English, but we also have presenters for Portuguese, Hindi, Spanish, and French. This training event is really a starting point for anyone who is new to NextFlow and NF Core. It is best if you have a basic understanding of the command line already. However, um, you don't necessarily need an understanding of different bioinformatic tools that we'll be using as examples. A lot of what we will be showing is really used to demonstrate concepts and ideas that are a part of NextFlow and NF Core. Um, so if you do want to apply what we're teaching here to other fields, uh, we hope that you can do so relatively quickly and easily. Each session will be around two hours long. However, there may be some slight differences day to day, um, as well as between presenters presenting in different languages. In session one, we'll be covering this welcome, as well as an introduction to NextFlow. We'll get you started by going through a, a simple example, and then we'll really expand on this using a proof of concept RNA-seq pipeline. In session two, we'll have a brief introduction to NF Core. Uh, we'll go through some of the tools available for NF Core users developers, as well as really dig into what modules and sub-workflows are and how they can be used between different uh, NextFlow and NFCore pipelines. In session three, we'll really expand on some of the ideas that we've touched on as a part of session one and two. Uh, we'll talk about how you can manage dependencies and containers. We'll dig into these NextFlow ideas of channels, processes, and operators. We'll have an introduction to Groovy, as well as modularization. In session four, we will continue to delve into more detail that you will have been exposed to in the previous days, such as the configuration of pipelines, different deployment scenarios, how you can use cache and resume, some more stra excuse me, troubleshooting strategies, um, as well as how you can get started with NextFlow Tower. To access the training material, you can follow this link here, which is training.nextflow.io, and this training material is free to access at any time. You will need a GitHub account to access the GitPod training environment, so GitHub um, you can create a GitHub account quickly and easily on the GitHub website. Um, and like I said, you will need this to access the GitPod training material, but I will expand on this very shortly. Recordings of these sessions will be available after the event as well. So if you can't attend the entire session or you want to come back and watch something again, you will be able to do so. For asking questions as a part of this training, um, you'll be able to direct your questions to the different Slack channels for the different languages. Community volunteers will be available to help you during the event. Please be patient if your question isn't answered immediately. Uh, we've almost got 800 to 1,000 people have registered at the time that we're recording these videos. Um, so at the time of the event, there may be a lot more questions than people available to answer, but we'll do our best to make sure that everyone's question is answered in a timely fashion. So let's get started. This is the, the training uh, material website, but first we will have a short introduction presentation, which should take about 20 minutes. Okay, so we will start off with this introduction to fresh principle data analysis with NextFlow and NFCore. So when you think about NextFlow and NFCore, you might think about open science, this idea that pipelines and data and our research should be transparent and accessible to others to make sure that what we are doing uh, is done using best practices. You might also think about open source, so NextFlow um, as an open source tool. If you're interested in what's happening under the hood as a part of the NextFlow software, you can actually go and look at all of the code because it's all available online. And this is really important for reproducibility. Um, and this idea of open science is because you can actually go away and really understand what's happening as a part of a part of these tools. You might also think of open community. So both NextFlow and NFCore have these open communities where people can contribute and collaborate and work on either the software or pipelines together uh, rather than all working as isolated silos all over the world. We also know that um, genomics and pipelines um, can be complicated. So as already mentioned um, in the introduction just before, um, we will be using a lot of genomics examples as a part of this training material, but a lot of this can be applied to fields outside of the life sciences. Um, one of these concepts is that with genomic workflows, as well as a lot of other workflows and pipelines, there can be a lot of data. So with a genomic pipeline, uh, you can produce terabytes and terabytes of data across samples um, and during different parts of a processing pipeline. 
you might also find that there are a lot of different tools that are involved. So you might find that a particular piece of software or script you've written as in Python or R or even MATLAB, Perl, um, or even just a bash script. All of these might need to work together and have different dependencies. Um, and it can be really difficult to actually combine all of this into one large pipeline. We also know that the way that data is passed around may be dynamic. So a piece of software um, might pass some pass an output into a different piece of software, but based on some logic, it might be getting pushed somewhere else as well. So the way data is passed through the pipeline can also be incredibly dynamic and complicated. To visualize this in a slightly different way, this is actually a, a pipeline that was created to annotate, annotate excuse me, a parasite genome. So this pipeline actually has 70 different tasks, including 55 custom scripts and 39 software tools and libraries. Every little circle there is actually one of those different tasks involving a different custom script and or piece of software um, or library. And all the different lines suggest that data is being passed between these different processes or tasks um, in quite a dynamic way. We know that pipelines can be incredibly complicated, but also that the reproducibility can be very difficult. And when I say that, I mean that if you were to reproduce your pipeline on one computer using exactly the same softwares and tools to try and reproduce it on another, you might actually get different results. And here is a pipeline, excuse me, a paper from the early days of NextFlow um, showing here in sort of panel A that when you run this gene annotation pipeline that I've just shown on different running environments, you can get different results. So here, for example, you have the same pipeline uh, being run on an Amazon Linux um, with NextFlow and Docker, Amazon Linux with the, the native, um, as well as the Mac OX with the native. And you can see that this overlapping Venn diagram shows that there are different genes annotated in each of those different environments. Down the bottom of panel C, you can also see that there's a gene um, transcript quantification uh, for differential expression, and that you get the same effect between different um, running environments. However, you can also see there over to the right that when you run NextFlow with Docker on two different environments, you can get um, exactly the same results, showing that with the right workflow manager and using containers, you can produce um, exactly the same results across different running environments, which is really important. We also know that when you read a paper or you're trying to replicate someone else's results, quite often the methods that have been described as a part of that paper um, or online as a part of a repository don't always have all the information you need. This is a representation of this showing an iceberg. And as you can see underneath the iceberg, there's a lot of extra information, um, which in this case has been suggested that it hasn't been described properly. So things like the actual language at all was written in, the OS, the version, the metadata, different file formats, the availability of software, parameter options and references for all of this aren't always shown. Um, and there's a really nice reference down there at the bottom if you want to go away and um, read about this more. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is that even though you might have, for example, a version of a software, there's a lot more that is required to actually reproduce a pipeline um, across different sites, across different environments, um, and by different sort of researchers and or groups. So um, as already suggested, this is where NextFlow comes in and can help you with reproducibility crisis is probably the best way to describe it. So NextFlow is a language. As a part of that language, we have processes. So processes are these sort of single units that I'll refer to throughout the rest of the training. Um, and these can be thought of really as the execution of a single task or process. As a part of NextFlow, we have this, this concept of channels, which is used to pass data between these processes. So a process might turn um, one, for, one file format to another, and we can pass that into a separate tool using channels. As we string all of these processes together with channels, collectively, we would refer to this as a workflow. So our workflow is written in NextFlow, and it is made up of processes and channels. This is a very simple example of what a, um, a single process pipeline might work look like with NextFlow. So at the top, you can see that we have a process block, um, which we have given the name FastQC. We have given it an input, in this case, path input, and output, which is a path to this FastQC um, zip or HTML file. And down the bottom, we have a script block, which is the actual execution of the tool that we are running, in this case, FastQC. 
for those that are outside of bioinformatics, FastQC is a tool used to uh, really sort of check the quality of an input um, file. Down the bottom, we have a workflow block, which we have a channel, which is bringing in the FastQ files, and we are piping this into the FastQC process. Like I said, this is a really simple singular process workflow written using Nextflow, um, but it's just to show that the language is reasonably simple um, with sort of clear definitions of inputs, outputs, as well as a script block. As a part of Nextflow as well, we have something called implicit parallelism. Um, so with the workflow block and with multiple files, um, using the channels and processes, you can divide this and have processes run in parallel. So this can be really powerful because you can run uh, multiple processes or the same process, uh, multiple tasks, the same process at the same time. And this can really speed up the way your pipeline is run. Um, and it's also really powerful because you can distribute your pipeline and resources across a cluster or the cloud quickly and easily. So down the bottom here, we have some BAM files, which are another common file type when you are dealing with bioinformatics. Um, that data is being passed into a process and is being split out um, into different FASTQ files. So as already mentioned, we have this parallelization, but we also have re-entrancy. So with Nextflow, you can use a resume um, flag, which would allow you to re-enter a pipeline at a particular stage. And this is something we will explore as a later part of the training. But using the resume flag, if your pipeline has failed or you want to tweak something as a part of your pipeline halfway through, using re-entrancy, you can jump back into the pipeline at the part that it either failed or that you have edited, meaning that you don't need to rerun the entire pipeline. So with bioinformatics as an example, processes can take a long, um, a long time and allow, excuse me, um, include a lot of compute. So being able to re-enter a pipeline at a different stage or a stage halfway through a pipeline um, is a lot better because it means that you don't have to re-analyze or re-compute something that you've already done. Ultimately as well, Nextflow also has a lot of reusability. So a lot of the things we will talk about is the rest of this training um, lead, lead into this idea of reusability and that because the pipeline is portable, um, you can have all your software and versions contained as part of Nextflow, uh, it can be very reusable across different sites um, by different people as well. So um, we will talk about different aspects of this now as well. So the first is code, the second is software, and finally compute. So when you are managing your code, Nextflow has automatic integration of your, all of your favorite version control software. So you can use things like Git, GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, Gitea as examples. And with this, you can allow for exact version controlling of a particular pipeline as it develops over time. As well as this, Nextflow has automatic integration of all your favorite software managers, including Docker, Podman, Singularity, and Conda. And all this is really important for one portability, but also reproducibility. Finally, for the compute, Nextflow will allow you to scale your pipeline across all of your favorite HPC and cloud providers. So we have a few listed here, but there are many more. So SunGrid Engine, um, Slurm as examples, as well as your favorite cloud for HPC, um, as well as things like um, Microsoft, Google, and AWS for cloud providers. Reproducibility is really important with Nextflow, um, and Nextflow really helps with making your code and pipelines reproducible. You can quickly and easily, as already mentioned, change your software um, manager by adding something called a directive at the top of your process block. Um, so here we've added um, Conda, but you can easily change this to Docker or Singularity as examples. Um, all of this can be quickly and easily changed in a single line. You can quickly do this by just changing Conda to container as an example. Um, and when we're talking about the different execution platforms, here we've added Executor Slurm, meaning that this could be used um, on your HPC cloud, excuse me, HPC rather than cloud provider, um, or even something that, um, excuse me, this can scale to HPC or cloud very quickly and easily. So um, Nextflow really helps with reproducibility between runs, it is portable between systems, and it is scalable everywhere. That's where I'll stop with Nextflow for now, and I'll transition to talking a little bit about NF Core. So NF Core is a community effort to collect a curated set of analysis pipelines built using Nextflow. This has been heavily rooted in the life sciences, um, particularly genomics, um, but there's really nothing stopping this from um, evolving into other fields as well, if you do have a background outside of, outside of the life sciences. 
currently there are 75 different pipelines that are um, available as a part of the NF Core uh, community. As a part of NF Core as well, there are various tools that have been developed to help with the running of pipelines, the writing of pipelines, and the testing and automation of pipelines as they are developed. This is something that we'll explore heavily as a part of session two, which will be tomorrow. NF Core also hosts a lot of uh, modules and sub workflows. So modules is a word that we use to describe uh, processes for um, analyzing bioinformatic data uh, most frequently. Um, so using different pieces of software. Um, and these have all been packaged into what we are calling modules, um, which are really just the processes. Um, they've been all written in a way and tested in a way that they can be shared between different workflows. We also have sub workflows, which are the chaining of different modules together. And again, they can be shared between different modules and using the NF Core tooling, both of these can be installed, um, adapted or removed from pipelines very quickly and easily. NF Core has these sort of core ideas um, that make it more than just a repository. It has this, this sort of ethos that we should be developing with the community. So we will all work together on larger, larger pipelines or initiatives um, make our code available for others so that we can all benefit from this larger community. Pipelines start from a common template, and this is really important because this will help you develop best practice from the start of your development process. As well as this, you'll be able to automatically integrate uh, different templates as they are developed by the NF Core community, and this will help keep your code up to date um, as your pipeline develops and needs to be maintained over time. There's also this really core, um, probably one of the most important concepts of collaborating rather than duplicating. So NF Core will discourage creating more than one pipeline for the same type of analysis. So this stops there being four different versions of the same pipeline. Together we all work on the same pipeline together and improve it by adding features um, and making sure that it's maintained rather than duplicating the amount of work um, and creating more work for everyone by having more than one version of a pipeline to maintain. Here are some numbers about the NF Core community. Um, as it stands, so there are a little over 4,000 Slack users, more than 500 GitHub organization members. Uh, there's over 1,500 GitHub contributors, as well as more than 3,000 Twitter followers. These numbers do evolve quite rapidly, um, and I anticipate that as a part of this training event, we'll have many more Slack users um, and many more GitHub organization members as well. If you're not already a part of these, I really encourage you to go away and join these um, after the training or during the training. The NF Core community is very global, so we have a very strong user base in Europe and the Americas. Um, we're also expanding into other areas such as Latin America and um, Asia Pacific. Um, if you are from those areas and even want to talk about anything, uh, we do have dedicated uh, developer advocates in both regions. Um, so we're really, really happy um, to hear from you if you want to sort of talk about different, um, different things that you want to happen in your region. Here is a paper describing the NF Core community. So this is a 2020 paper, um, sort of really describing some of the things that we talked about about NF Core. Um, because it is 2020 and we're already in 2023, some of the, the numbers in this will be a little bit out of date, uh, but it gives you a really good overview of kind of the core ideas behind NF Core um, and some of the, the amazing things you can do um, as a part of the community. Finally, I'll finish on talking a little bit about Nextflow Tower. So Nextflow Tower is a product of Secura Labs. It gives you an intuitive launchpad interface for launching your pipelines with um, your, excuse me, your NF Core or Nextflow pipelines. Um, it allows you to launch, manage, and monitor your pipelines um, either locally or on the cloud. You can share runs with um, your teams so they can all be monitored um, by others as part of the group. Um, and as already mentioned, you can create cloud infrastructure um, and you can access this very quickly um, with a single click. Down the bottom there is a, is a link to tower.nf if you want to know more about that. Nextflow Tower has different tiers. Um, so there's a community open source version, there's a cloud version, which is free and paid tiers, as well as an enterprise version, which is commercial. If you want to learn more about these, um, you can get in touch with the Nextflow Tower um, team um, and talk about different things that might be available to you um, at, your, at your institute or um, workplace. Uh, there is just some details to me. Um, if you want to know more about um, Nextflow, um, the summit from 2020, all of the talks are online and a really great resource for 
um, anyone who is developing or, or wants to know more about, about Nextflow. Um, down the side there, we have some information about the current training, which is happening right now, as well as NF Core Hackathon, which is happening in a couple of weeks. Um, if you haven't already participated in the Hackathon, it's a really great community event where everyone sort of works together on some of the, the core um, NF Core pipelines, modules, as well as tooling and documentation. Okay, so now we will jump to the training material. So what we will do is we'll jump back to that website that I showed you previously, um, and we will start working through the, the training material. Okay, so here we are on the Nextflow training website. Um, as you can see, it's training.nextflow.io. Um, it's up there and then the browser. What I would like everyone to do is scroll halfway down the page to a list of the available workshops. And what we'll be using is the workshop material. This is basic Nextflow training workshop uh, content just here. And we can access this by clicking on the green button that says start the Nextflow training workshop. What that'll do is take us to this uh, next welcome screen which is a welcome to the training workshop material and an outline of what you should be able to do and understand by the end of this, this course. So by the end of the course, you should be proficient in writing Nextflow pipelines. You should know the basic concepts of channels, processes, and operators. You should know understanding of containerized workflows. You should understand the different execution platforms supported by Nextflow, and you'll be introduced to the Nextflow community and ecosystem. As a part of this, in session two, we will talk about NF Core and we'll look at some of the tooling and documentation that is available as a part of that community initiative. So first things first is we need to set up an environment so that you can participate, follow along with some of the coding that I'm doing uh, as a part of this workshop. So over here to the left, we have environment set up and we will click on that. This will take us to this page here which has some instructions for installing everything you need, either locally or through Gitpod. So while you could install everything locally, um, I do really recommend that you use Gitpod. So Gitpod is a free virtual environment that you can use for up to 50 hours per month using the, the base environment. Um, it has everything that you need already installed in this environment. Uh, so such as the data, all the scripts um, and all the tooling, uh, it's all already installed in there. Um, however, if you do want to sort of think locally, we do have instructions for that listed here. So um, here, for example, we have a list of the requirements. So Bash, Java, Git, and Docker, some op optional requirements there. Just beneath that, we have how you can download Nextflow. So we have this wget command as well as curl, so you can pull uh, Nextflow into your system, and then you'll need to make it executable uh, down here. As well as that, you'll need to download, install, and register for Docker. Um, you can do that by following this link here. Um, we don't have all the information on this website, with, excuse me, website as a part of this content. Um, but like I said, if you follow this link, it'll take you to everything you need to be able to do that. To get the training material, you'll need to clone it from this GitHub repository. This will download all of the scripts as well as all the data that we'll use as a part of this training. However, like I said, I do really recommend that you use Gitpod and you can quick access this Gitpod environment by following this link here, which is under 1.2.1. So if you click on that, um, it should create a new Gitpod environment for you. I have already used Gitpod before. Um, I already opened this earlier today just to check that it was all working. So for me, I had a, a message saying, do I want to open a new environment, which I said yes for you. If you're, this is the first time you're using Gitpod, you might need to authenticate your account using your GitHub credentials, um, and it may take a little bit longer for everything to load. But while that is loading, uh, what we can do is just kind of explore what is appearing in my Gitpod environment and my training window. So as you can see here, it's just pulling the container image. Um, so this is the image that contains everything that we need to participate or run this training. What you should see is a window that looks like this um, appearing. So this is effectively what you expect to see is like a VS Code uh, window as an example. Down the side, we have all of our file options um, over here. So for example, file, 
Um, we can open files or folders and things like that. Down here, we have extensions that we have installed. Um, and some of these are used as a part of the training material. You don't need to worry about anything or having these installed. Here we have the Explorer, which we can see this NF training folder. Inside of that, we have some data. Um, when I say data, I mean we have more folders with data inside those, as well as a number of NF scripts. So these are the next five scripts that we'll be using at different parts of this material and different parts of this material, as well as a config file and a YAML file, which are also used during the training. Here in the main browser, we have what is the Nextflow training material. So this is a link to um, the web, effectively the same content that we came from, from the environment setup. Um, what you can do is you can either keep this open and follow along with this in your browser. Um, you can open other scripts and these will just open up alongside and you can just flip between. Um, alternatively, you can close this and just use it in your browser window. Down the bottom, we have the terminal. So this is just the NF training um, terminal. This is where we will do all of our coding. Uh, what you can see is just we already have all of the normal functions that you'd expect on a normal Linux system down there as well. Hopefully everyone has now managed to load a Gitpod environment. Um, if not, do feel free to pause this training video um, and just take a little bit longer to make sure everything is loaded um, properly before you continue. Okay, so what I'll do first is just check that I do have Nextflow installed. So if you just run Nextflow, um, what you'll see is that you get a list of all the functionality of Nextflow and some of the options available to it. What we will do first is just show you the version. So here, for example, you can see that you can use this minus V to actually view the version of Nextflow that we're running. So you can see Nextflow version uh, 22.10.4. But what I would like to do is actually pin a version of Nextflow. So what I will do is I'm going to type in export and then nxf underscore ver short for version and then type in 22.04.5. So this is just exporting this, um, this system variable uh, to my environment. Now when I use Nextflow minus V, what you should see is that it is um, downloading something, in this case, a slightly older version of Nextflow, and it has given me that as the output down there. So you can see 22.04.5. And the cool thing about this is that this is a really good way of making sure that the version of Nextflow you're running is reproducible. Um, the Nextflow is a rapidly evolving tool and there's always new features. Uh, being added, but just to make sure that everything is reproducible on my system and yours, um, we can run it like this. Okay, so what I will do next um, is go through some of the introductory material. So over here, back in the training material, we're now going to click on introduction. So this is underneath environment setup over here on the left. And what we have here is 2.1, which is basic concepts. So this is Kind of reinforcing some of the things that I went through as a part of the initial slides and introduction. Um, but what I want to do as a part of this training is sort of keep coming back to these core concepts because um, they are really fundamental to being able to write uh, efficient pipelines using Nextflow. So Nextflow is an orchestration engine um, and domain-specific language, a DSL, um, that makes it easier to write data-intensive computational pipelines. Some of its core features of Nextflow include uh, workflow portability and reproducibility, scalability, of parallelization and deployment and integration of existing tools, systems, and industry standards. So this is really how you can like integrate Git, for example, um, and use different software management tools like Docker, Singularity, and Conda. Nextflow really has these, these core concepts, um, which again will keep coming up, uh, and these are processes and channels. So in practice, your Nextflow pipeline is built up of lots of different processes, which themselves are joined by channels. So processes are executed independently, so they are isolated from each other. This is something we will uh, will make a bit more sense when we talk about the work directory, but they do not share a common writable state, um, and they communicate via asynchronous first in first out queues called channels. So this is something that um, I mentioned earlier as well, is that all of these processes can be run in parallel as separate tasks. So any process can divide one or more channels as an input or an output, um, and these are all connected by um, different channels and you can sort of string these together and sort of create these webs of interacting uh, processes. 
not so much interacting, but these um, these processes are you can communicate between these processes using channels, um, using like I said, these input and output declarations. So here is just a, a diagram to help explain this: that we have a channel which has data z, y, and x. All of that is going into this process and is being split out as task one, two, and three. So all of these can run in parallel, and these are being taken. Uh, the data is being taken as an input, and then there's some sort of output which has been given. Uh, in this case, that's been called x, y, and z. Something I haven't spoken about a lot already, but will be a reoccurring theme as well, is execution abstraction. So what this really means is that your next node pipeline is extracted from, or abstracted from the runtime. So you can write your Nexo pipeline in any coding language. So you can have R, Python, Bash, um, Perl, MATLAB, many others. You can orchestrate these tasks using the data flow programming, meaning that you can really sort of tune how these, these scripts interact using inputs and outputs. You can define the software dependencies via containers. Um, or other software management, so Conda, Docker, and Singularity. Um, as well as this, we have built-in version control with Git, so you can pull straight from GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, and use versioning really quickly and easily as a part of your Nexo pipeline. All of this is extracted from the Nextflow runtime, so you can move this entire pipeline, which is already carrying information that will help define its software, its version, uh, as well as the code that it's running, into different runtime environments and orchestrate this on different systems. So you can move your entire pipeline and very quickly and easily scale and reproduce it on AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, uh, as well as any of your favorite HPC systems such as um, Grid Engine or Slurm. Oop. Scrolled a bit too far there. Um, finally, just something I wanted to sort of go back and touch on again is that Nextflow is um, a DSL, so, so domain specific language. Um, in practice, it's actually an extension of the Groovy programming language. You don't need to know a lot of Groovy to write good pipelines with Nextflow. A little bit does help, but by no means do you need to be an expert in Groovy and Java um, or anything even close to an expert to write your pipelines using Nextflow. Okay, so um, that's all I wanted to sort of talk about as an introduction. I think the best thing to do is just jump straight into some coding. So down here under 2.2.1, we have um, our first script, which is hello.nf. And I just wanted to highlight here that there are like little um, pluses that you can click on to get more information about each of these lines of code um, and, and what they're doing. But to start off with, I think I will go over here and open this up as well. So over here in my Explorer, I have hello.nf. And this is exactly the same script that is already included here. Um, I just have it over here in my terminal now. What I will do um, is quickly just outline some of the um, lines of code, what they're doing, and how they might sort of interact with each other. So starting off here with line one, we have a shebang, which is just declaring that this is an Xflow statement. Here in line three, we have the string hello world that is going into this params.greeting. Params.greeting is a little bit special um, because we have the params dot at the start. Uh, meaning it is a parameter, and it can actually be edited on the command line. I'll show you how to do this very shortly uh, after we've run this script uh, one or two times. Here in line four, we are turning channel, we are using channel.of, which is a channel factory, to turn params.greeting into a channel, and we're calling that greeting underscore ch, or greeting underscore channel. You might find that I either refer to this as ch or just channel, because um, largely um, this sort of phrasing here, ch, is, is used to describe channel. So again, we have the string that's gone into params.greeting. Params.greeting is being turned into a channel by this channel of, which is a channel factory, and that is being called greeting.channel, greeting underscore channel. Over here uh, on line six, we have the start of our first process, and down here on line 18, we have the start of our second process. Each process has an input, an output, and a script block. Some script blocks start with a script, uh, just like this, but it isn't actually required uh, for that to be detected because it's already got these three speech marks to wrap it up. So for this first process, split letters, 
we have an input and output and the script block. The name split letters is somewhat arbitrary. Um, you can call your processes anything you want, but I would recommend that you do call them something that is familiar or identifiable as a part of a larger workflow script. For the input, we have a value. So there are different data types that you can use for, um, for uh, when you're using Nextflow. Um, one of those is a value and the second is a path. So here we have a value, which is X. X has also been named uh, somewhat arbitrarily. You can call this anything you want, any letter, any name, any string. Um, anything can really go in there. Um, there are a few exceptions, sort of reserved strings, but uh, reserved names, but largely you can call this pretty much anything you want. For an output, we have a chunk, uh, which is going to be chunk underscore with this wildcard. So anything with the, the prefix chunk underscore will be picked up as a part of the output path. Paths are generally used for files and folders, while the values are more for uh, strings. Down here in the script block, we have the printf function. So this is a, um, it's kind of like a base function that some of you might already be familiar with. And what that's doing is, is printing, in this case, x, or this variable x. So this x is defined up here as our input, and we're using the dollar sign to make it a variable that is getting piped into split. So split is another function that you'd expect to find on most uh, Linux bash systems. So it is splitting the printed input into chunks of six, and it is outputting that into files with the prefix chunk underscore. And you can see that this chunk underscore is the same as what we have here in the output meaning that the output of the split function will be picked up as the output here uh, with anything at the end because we do have that wildcard um, sort of glob pattern. Down here in the second process, which we've called convert to upper, again, we have an input and an output. The input is a path, which we've called Y, and the output is standard output. So this is effectively just like a printed screen function. Down here in the script block, we have a cat. We have cat which is going to print the contents of Y, which in this case is um, what we have as the input. So it is going to print the, print the input files. That is going to get piped into this function TR, which is effectively going to turn all of the small letters into capital letters uh, as described using this AZ to AZ. Okay, so you'll notice as well that both of these have been closed off. Um, all the processes have been closed off. Um, and down here on line 30, uh, we have the workflow block. What we see here on line 31 is the split to letters process. It is taking greetings underscore ch or greetings underscore channel, which is what we've defined up here in line four. So this is a channel of params.greeting, which in this case is hello world. So split letters is taking hello world, or is accepting hello world, um, has been passed through this greetings uh, underscore ch channel, and that is being given out as letters underscore ch, that is the name of the output channel. This is then getting put into the convert to upper process, so this is that second process that we've just defined or described. We've also added this dot flat into the end of that, so this is a little bit um, this will be new, we haven't talked about this yet. So dot .flatten is actually an operator. And operators are um, ways that we can kind of manipulate a channel so that we have the channel shaped in a way with the right parts in the right places um, to help sort of, like I said, manipulate uh, what you might expect as an input or an output from two different channels, excuse me, from two different processes to match each other. So if a channel is shaped wrong, if you have too much or too little information in there, um, it won't necessarily match up, and you can use these operators to help um, you know, merge, separate, flatten, um, mix outputs and inputs um, to make them sort of match or, or join each other. In this case, we're using the flatten, um, which is to split the two files into two separate items um, to be put through the process separately. Um, so we have this letters.channel, and a set of the outputs of greeting.channel, which in this case will be multiple files um, because we have multiple chunks created by um, splitting hello world into multiple chunks. Um, it is combining it all into one element, 
and feeding that into convert to upper. The output of this is results underscore channel. Um, and we can see this down here again on line 33, where we have a different operator, which in this case is dot view. Um, we have this, um, this IT and um, squiggly brackets. Um, so that's really just meaning that we're going to take the item um, and view it, or we're going to view the contents or view those channels um, as items, or view the item channel. Um, we will come back and revisit this later um, in session three, but for now it's just worth knowing that this, this view operator is used to view uh, the results channel. Okay, um, so I think the easiest thing to do is just to jump in and actually show you how to run this, and then we can look at the outputs and start to discuss what we're actually looking at. So to run a NextFlow script, you use NextFlow run. And in this case, I'm going to execute the hello.nf script, which is the script that we've just talked about. So line one, we can see the version of NextFlow that is run. Line two, we can see that we are launching this hello.nf. It has been given a name. So every time you run a pipeline, it'll be given a different name, um, which is made of two parts, a verb and a name. Um, it is DSL2, um, so just for reference, it used to be DSL1, but now NextFlow is exclusively running DSL2, unless you use an older version of the software. Down here on line three with the executor, which in this case is local, um, even if you're running this locally on your own device, this should say local. Um, this would change to the name of your HPC system or the cloud provider that you're using, if you're using either of those um, down the line. Over here on line four, we have um, this hex decimal number. This is something we will discuss in more detail. It is generated based on um, the script you are running and the files that you're inputting into this, but this is effectively a way to um, identify where a process has been run, and we can explore this as part of the work directory. But for now, all you need to know is that we have run this split letters process. Um, we have run it to 100%, so it's all been completed, and that was one of one task, so it's been run once. Here on the next line, we have convert to upper, has been run to completion 100%, and this was done two of two times. Here is the standard output, so this is what was actually printed to screen as a part of the output, and we have hello and world. What we might find is if we run this multiple times, is that this may actually be world hello. Um, I can never guarantee if this will or won't happen, um, but this is just because of the first in, first out, um, asynchronous queues that are created uh, because of the channels and occasionally what you'll find is that world will reach the standard out before uh, hello does but that was three from three of hello world rather than world hello um, so we might just call that as a loss and move on okay so I'll just quickly touch on um, these hexadecimals again so um, like I said what you can find is that these hexadecimals are generated for every process. So every time a process is run as a separate task, you might find that um, these, oh, we have world hello. Um, it'll be given a different hexadecimal, hexadecimal name. These will be created and stored as separate isolated folders in your work directory. So what you might notice or might have noticed already is that we now have this work directory over here in blue on my screen. If you look inside this, you'll see a number of different um, two-digit sort of numbers and or letters. These are all generated by these hexadecimal numbers that we see over here next to our processes that have been executed. Here, for example, if we were to go into this one here, which is 7E, uh, you could see something like um, LS work 7E. Yours might be completely different. Um, if you don't see a 7E, it's because I've generated that on my system and you might have generated something else. Um, you can also see the end of this, which is C, D, 1B, D, 6. That's the start of the rest of this long string here. Um, and if you actually go in and look at that, you can see chunk A and chunk A, B. So these are both generated as a part of the split letters. Um, and if you actually uh, were to cat those and look at the contents of those files, Kind of what we do as a part of that second convert to upper process. Um, you would see chuck AA, you would see hello. So that's um, hello, which is being converted to upper as part of the next process. This is really just to show that 
this has um, happened in a separate work folder and we can use these hexadecimals to actually identify those. Um, for the sake of this training, what I will do is I'm going to remove my work directory. So rmref work, that has removed the work directory, so it's no longer there. Um, there's no other magic sort of happening behind the scenes apart from a few log files that have been created uh, over here in my Explorer that were created as a part of the execution. Uh, they're just used to kind of help keep track of what's going on. Um, and I can also reference those if there were errors. What I will do is I'm going to run this again. Uh, so next flow run hello.nf. But what I want to do is turn off ANSI lock. So what this is doing is it's turning um, the ANSI log into false or off. Um, there are a number of different sort of flags you can use as a part of NextFlow, and these will help sort of um, control what's happening. And there's, there's a big long list of these in the documentation. Um, this is just one of them. But what I've done here is I have split this out so that we now see every process separated out as a separate line. So instead of previously when the second execution of convert to upper, the second task of convert to upper would have just been shown on top of this one. So we wouldn't have seen this 4C um, at all. And all we would have seen with this 03. Here they are separate lines. And what you could see is that if we actually looked into the work directory, uh, we'll see a folder created for each of those. Um, and then of course, much like we did before, we could go in um, and actually look at the contents of that, which um, in this case would be chunk A and chunk A B again. Okay, um, what's next? Let's look at the resume function. So to demonstrate how you can use the reentrancy in NextFlow, what we will do is we will modify our script and we're just going to have uh, reverse and then we're going to use that on Y. So this again, uh, this is the convert to upper process, which I've just edited in my hello.nf script. So we're going to use the y, um, we're going to designate that as the variable by using the dollar sign, then we're going to use this reverse function. What this should do is it'll modify the script or the second process as a part of the script. And what we will do is we will use this resume function. So here we have nextflow run hello.nf dash resume. Now, what we should see is the word cached come up next to our processes. So because we have this work directory, everything we do with NextFlow is created uh, or happens in these, these isolated folders and the work directory. And then if we were to rerun NextFlow using resume, what you will find is that we can access those folders and NextFlow will know if it has or hasn't run this particular process before. And if it hasn't been modified or changed in any way, then we can resume it from the point that it has changed. So in this case, split to letters hasn't changed and we can use the cache. But down here, because convert to upper, the process has changed, it cannot be cached and it had to be rerun again. What you can see here, down here is the output. We have hello world um, in reverse. So we no longer see those turned to capital letters. Instead, we just have it printed in reverse. If we were to run this again, using the resume functionality again, what we should find is that we have cached for both of these. Cool. Okay, so uh, what you can see here is that two of two again, but instead of um, only having cached up here on split letters, we also have it down below, below on convert to upper. So Nextflow knew that all of this has already been computed and we didn't have to run it again. So this is a really powerful way to, um, if something has gone wrong with your pipeline and you want to edit something or even add in another sample, something like that, um, you can quickly resume it from a point while not having to recompute everything that you'd already processed. What um, I'd like to show next um, is how to use um, or how to override parameters using the command line. So up here in line three, we have this params.greeting. And as I mentioned, the params are a little bit special and that we can actually overwrite these in the command line. So this is a common feature for anything that is a parameter and starts with this params. Um, as a part of a pipeline or in a pipeline. 
So what we can do is we are going to run this again. I might just clear this to make it a little bit easier for everyone to see. So we have next flow run. We are going to go hello.nf. And then we are going to go greetings or dash dash greetings. So we can use dash dash to access parameters as a part of the pipeline. And in this case, I am going to copy in this greetings. This is the same greeting that is used as a part of the introductory training material. Um, you can use any other greeting or any other string that you like. Oh, I think that should have been greeting, not greeting. So this will likely spit back some type of error. So uh, this is still run because this greeting that I have specified, um, there weren't any checks there to make sure it was real. Um, it's relied on the hello.world up here um, rather than being overwritten using my string in the command line. So this should give us a slightly different output. Yep, so there we go. So this is still going through split letters. It's been split into three chunks this time because it's a little bit longer. Uh, then it's gone through convert to upper, which we have modified to print the string in reverse. And we can see these three strings printed out here. Uh, because this is a slightly longer string, what we can also demonstrate is actually going in and seeing what's happening in the work directory. We can go and look at this AA, 8, AF, 9, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see what's in there. We can see we've got chunk AA, chunk AB, and AC. Um, and if we actually look at those uh, like we did earlier, um, you'll see that um, each of these will have slightly different contents being the string that has been split. Okay, so that is all I wanted to show you with this uh, hello.nf example. Like I said, there is more information about all of this in here, and you can click on um, these little plus marks, look at them in more detail. What we've done is we've worked through just running the script. We've had a, um, a look at this ANSI log. Uh, we've modified it and resumed it. And we've looked at overriding this using um, the params uh, as a variable, of overriding the parameter greetings. Right down the bottom here in 2.4.1, um, some of you might be used to looking at um, DAGs which this is just a, another representation of what we've already done or what I've spoken about already, um, showing that you can have uh, your inputs, which is put through a channel, uh, put into a channel, um, pass through the two processes, and then we have the outputs here um, down the bottom. Okay, so next thing we will do is we will move on to the simple RNA-seq pipeline. So, this is really a demonstration of a real world biomedical scenario. Um, and we call this a proof of concept because it isn't a real um, RNA seq pipeline. It's, it's merely just an example that we're going to use some commonly used bioinformatic tools, um, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, um, just to show how this can be like a real world application. If you are unfamiliar with RNA seq and um, you're coming from outside of the life sciences in particular, um, Please don't worry too much about what these tools are doing. Um, I encourage you just to think about how you could apply your own data to these situations. And if you use similar tools, um, you know, in different fields or, or, or whatever you're doing, um, just sort of focus on the, the big concepts rather than exactly what's happening uh, with each with each execution of each um, script and piece of piece of software. So uh, what we will do is we will jump over to um, the, the Gitpod environment again. We can close this hello.nf and what we will do is we'll go over to the explorer again over here on the left and we'll click on script one so the first thing uh, we can do as a part of this is actually add um, i'm going to add a multi-string statement um, so multi-string statements are really just um, ways to Sort of just comment your code so if you want to add a comment um, in your code you can do that quite easily just by using oh by using this this is my code um, so this won't be detected by nextflow this is kind of like um, you know just a typical comment type statement as you'll see though um, in some of these later scripts we have this multi-line um, option which we can also use oh just close that um, and we can add that to the top so by using this this slash and then um, you don't actually need these in the middle what you do actually. Um, just to keep those, you can comment them out in different ways. But um, anyway, if you, if you have all of these in here, you can add in your 
um, um, just a multi-line comment, and then you can keep adding in, in lines um, as many as you want. This is a new line. Okay, that's, that's all kind of here and all there, but I just wanted to show that you can add in comments. What we have in here at the moment, so inside script one, so this is the unmodified file again, um, we have this params.reads, params.transcriptome file, and this params.multiqc. All of these are strings. Um, they are using the project dir as a base. So project dir is kind of like a reserved um, string, reserved variable that you can use to basically specify the project directory. So the directory um, that contains your project. And here, um, this has been um, this folder, the data folder with the GGL folder um, and some gut files inside of it. So what that actually means is over here um, inside this project directory, which in our case is this NF training folder, we have the data folder inside that we have the GGAL folder. Um, and inside that we have gut, liver and lung files, um, which appeared with one and two, one and two, one and two. Um, and then we have this, this FQ uh, file extension. For those outside of bioinformatics, um, you quite often have these, these fast queue files, FQ files, um, they're quite a common file format if you're looking at sequencing data. Um, so we have these three parameters, each of these have been defined as strings, or these are effectively strings. Um, in this case, they are file paths. Um, and down here on line five, we have this print, um, print line, which is a groovy function. Um, and what we're doing is just printing this line with the variable params.reads, which, which we've declared up here. Um, so we just run this um, NF core, not NF core, excuse me, next flow, um, next flow run, script one dot NF. So again, we can see um, next flow run, the version that was run. It's telling us what script was run and it's given us a name. Um, and here we just have the output, which in this case is reads. Um, and then this, this string uh, that was specified up here as a part of the params.reads. You can add as many different parameters to a pipeline as you want. I think the exercise that we have included as a part of this training material is actually adding in um, an out dir or an output directory um, as a parameter. So what it is asking you to do is add in a new parameter, params.outdir. Um, in this case, I think the example that we are using is just adding in results. So um, later on, we'll use this as a part of one of our pipelines, um, but we're just going to specify it now just as an optional parameter or a different parameter um, with the value results. Down here, for example, you could sort of substitute this out and call this any other um, any of the other parameters that we've included. In this case, it's just going to be uh, params to out there. Um, we can just run that again. So that's quite nice. Again, we can see the reads. Um, in this case, the, the params to out there is results, and we can see that printed to screen. So this is all well and good, and you could go away and, and create some quite complicated strings using the different Groovy functionality to print all this to your, your screen every time you run a pipeline. But um, Nexo also has built-in um, log functioning. So as shown in the training material, we can actually add in a log info with a multi-string statement. Um, so here, for example, we've actually got some information um, just saying this is an rna pipeline, and then sort of listing the transcript dome, the reads, and the output directory. Um, which you've already specified up here on line four. As well as that, we have this um, this other little bit um, here, which is um, strip indent, which is just going to strip the indentation uh, for when we put this to screen. So I'll just quickly run this again. And we're going to go next flow run, script one. And what we should see is some nicely formatted log um, information printed to screen. Um, so this is just a way to show that there is some built-in functionality for next flow to have like nice logging, for example, that you can um, print all this to screen, um, and this helps us keep track of what was actually gone into the pipeline um, and what it was called and, and potentially where it's come from. Okay, um, so we're going to move on to script two, um, which we can see here. So as you can see, we've already got this multi-line uh, statement or comment, um, and you can edit these as much as you want. I'm going to add a capital letter in there. 
Uh, we have the params.reads, transcriptome file, multi-QC, and outdir, where I put directory. We have the log info statement, which I've already added. And down here, we have another multi, multi-line statement. Okay. So what we've added to script two, which is different from script one, is this process block and this workflow block. So for this process block, much like in hello.nf, we have named it. In this case, we've called it index. We have an input and an output and a script. As the input, we have a path, which we have called transcriptome. So as I said earlier, you can actually call this anything you want, um, but it is nice to call it something that is familiar um, or at least identifiable. So we're calling um, the input, which we're insisting is a path rather than a value um, as transcriptome. Here we have a path as an output, which in this case is going to be salmon index. Um, it is going to be a fixed name. So this isn't going to be a variable name or anything like that. Um, so this is this the output will have to be called salmon.index specifically um, because we haven't added any any variable information in there. And this is in the, the, um, the quote marks. Down here in the script block, we have the salmon tool. So salmon is a tool that's commonly used as a part of RNA seq analysis. Um, so it's used to, um, it has lots of different functionality for different um, steps in, in RNA seq analysis. In this case, we're going to be using the index function of salmon. We have specified the number of threads. Um, we have specified the transcriptome file. And here we have specified what we want the output uh, to be called. So um, going back through this again, um, we're going to be calling salmon index being the functionality. Here we have threads. What we actually have here is tasks.cpu, and this is um, something that we haven't really spoken about, but tasks is used a little bit like params in that you can specify different, um, in this case, uh, task parameters for this particular process. So um, I will come back to this very shortly, but this is um, a way to control, in this case, the number of CPUs that are being allocated for this process. Um, here we have the transcriptome, which again was specified using a dollar sign, and up here we have the transcriptome, um, which is obviously the same. Um, so we're referring, when we're using this dollar sign transcriptome here, we're actually referring to this input transcriptome path. Down here is this i, uh, minus i, which is going to be the salmon index, which you've specified as the output. Um, I will come back to this tasks.cpu and, and show you how that works. Down here in the workflow block, we have the index process, and that will be um, using the params.transcriptome file. So this will be what is taken as the input transcriptome, which has to be a path. So when we are referring to the params.transcriptome underscore file, we're actually referring to uh, this particular string up here. So this is getting passed or given to the index process. And this is the script that is getting run on that. And this is where the input is used. So the transcriptome.fa is being used in here as a part of the script. So um, after all of that explanation, I think I'll just run the script um, to show how this works. So next flow, oh, next flow run, uh, in this case script 2.nf. And we'll see what the input is, excuse me, output is. So this is actually um, an error. So this is what an error would look like when you're running Nextflow, and this is actually expected. So let's just dissect what we're actually seeing here as a part of this error message. So we can see that there's an error executing the process index. Um, it was terminated with the exit, if the error exit status 127. This is the command that was executed. Um, the command output was empty. And then we can actually look at the command error, which was in line two, salmon command not found. So um, we will just take a little detour here and look at the work directory. So we've talked about the work directory a little bit already when we're looking at hello.nf. Um, if we actually go and look into this work folder, which is the same, um, hexadecimal that's created up here for this process. 
um, you can see that there's a number of different things that have been created. I've actually used um, LL here, which is very um, pretty much just an LSLA. So we can actually see um, a long list with all of the details for this folder. What you can see here is that we have um, a number of different files. So command.begin, command.error.log.out.run.sh. Um, all of these are created as a part of the NextFlow execution. Um, and as I've already sort of alluded to and mentioned, that this entire process is getting run in this folder. Everything that is required to run this process needs to be in this folder um, or accessible by this folder. In this case, the salmon tool was not actually available, so this process has failed. But you can actually go in and look at things like the command.sh, for example, so the actual command that was run, and you can see that this is the same um, command that was run um, up here in the command executed. Uh, when it's referring to line two, it's actually referring to, to line two here, which is the second line of this command.sh file. Anyway, uh, all of that is kind of an aside. The next question is how do we resolve this? So as already mentioned, there's, there's a lot of really um, easy integrations for different software managers. Um, in this case, I want to use Docker. So what I haven't shown you already is that over here in this nextflow.config file, um, we've actually already specified a container with the software that we want to use as a part of this pipeline. The problem here is that we haven't actually specified that we want to use Docker in the first place to uh, manage this container and, and use the software as part of this. So by adding this with Docker flag, uh, we can run this again. And what we should see is a successful run. So again, launching script two, it's about to go away and run this. Process one, one of one, success. So that's great. Um, we could add in with Docker onto every time we execute this run, but um, that can be a little bit tedious and easy to forget. What you can do is much like we've already specified the process container, some, pro, um, some Docker run options here, you can automatically include this as a part of this Nexo config file. So docker enabled equals true is, is the equivalent of adding this to the, um, to, the, to the command line. What I've done is I'm going to save that. Oh, cancel. I want to save that and click run again. And what we should see is that this is also uh, successful. Fantastic. So um, this is just an example how you can add information into a config file um, and use um, some quite smart logic by Nextflow to include um, things like containers and automatically enable Docker to run those containers. What I will do next is quickly show you how you can use the view operator to help view the contents of a channel. So in this situation, I want to use index underscore channel or underscore ch dot view. So you might remember view from the hello.nf example. We're using this to view the output um, from that script. So to view hello world. Um, here I've just added this into the workflow block. So dot view um, with the brackets at the end. And when we run this again, remembering that we've also got this buried into the configuration file, so that that will automatically use those that Docker image, which is also specified there. This will allow us to view. So the the dot view um, operator is allowing us to view the channel, uh, which again in this case is actually pointing back to this work directory where this file was created, and we can see that this is the path to that file and if you want to actually see what's inside that file in this case folder um, you can run um, ls on that and actually see that so this has all happened within the work directory we haven't actually asked nextflow to store this anywhere else for us just yet um, but it has run it has been created and is sitting there in the uh, index underscore channel okay um, as I said earlier as well, I was going to go back and revisit what's happening here with this tasks.cpus. So for every process, you can add things called directives. And directives are really used to help um, control the execution of that process. There are many, many different um, declarations you could use up here or directives um, to help manage this. Automatically, um, NextFlow is going to use one CPU um, as part of this process, but what you can do 
is allocate a different number of resources for this process. So here, for example, we're putting CPUs two. Um, this will run with two CPUs rather than one. So before we go any further, what I'll do is actually just show you um, what this previous run looked like. So we can go cat work. That was the location. We're going to go command, oh, show mm.sh. So again, this is the, the script that was actually run. And you can see there with threads, there is a one next to it. Now that I've updated this, we can run it again. Um, so next flow run script2.nf. We can look at this again. Um, so this is where this was actually um, the output because we've still got this view statement here. What I want to do though is actually look at that command that was run. So again, we can go um, cat for the work directory. We're going to look into this folder dot command dot sh. So again, this is the we know this is the path to this folder because we've got the start of the hexadecimal up here next to the process. And if we look at that again, you can see threads is two. So this was modified um, here as a part of this task execution. Um, of um, use the CPUs um, up here and change it to two. And this is now running with two CPUs rather than one. Okay, so that is everything I want to say about script two, and we will now move on to script three. So this is script three here. Um, as you can see, we've got some of the same stuff that we've already talked about. So uh, we're setting our parameters, we've got the log info there. But down here on line 18, you'll see something a little bit different. So on line 18, we are using another channel factory. So similar to the channel.of, which we used in the hello.nf, we are using from file pairs. So this is actually going to create channels from file pairs um, that are a part of, or that are identified as a part of um, rams.reads. So what I will do first is actually just um, run you through a few executions of this. Um, so what I'll do quickly is I'll clear um, clear my browser and I'm going to clear um, my work directory so it's nice and clean and you um, know that there's nothing else happening in the background there. What we can do is we can do next flow run script 3.nf. This should run and we won't see anything as the output. If we add in a view statement, much like we did previously, we can actually view the outputs of this channel and they'll be printed to screen. So what we can do um, is run this again, but with dot view at the end. So this is going to view this read pairs channel. So what do we see? We see one full channel with an element of gut. And the second element is this list of two files. So we have gut underscore fast one and gut underscore fast, <laughs> gut underscore one and gut underscore two dot FQ. So what do we think has happened? This channel factory from file pairs is taking in params dot reads, params dot, dot reads up here on line four of script three is the project directory the data folder, the um, the GG gal or the um, the GGL folder. Inside that we have the gut files with either a one or a two at the end. Dot fast Q. So using these curly brackets, allowing for either one or two in that position. We have gut at the start and the dot FQ at the end. So it is managing to identify both of these files here. Um, which in this case is, is gut underscore one and gut underscore two. Um, and this is the contents of these files. It's not overly important um, what's actually in those files. What has happened with the from files pairs is it identified that those two files are a pair. We have one, two files. It has identified that both of those are paths. It has found the base name of these two files, which is gut, and it created another element for that at the start. What that means is that these two files are now getting passed around as a pair of files, and we have a second element as a part of this channel, 
which is the first element in this case, a value, which is gut. So gut is like a string and we still have the two paths to gut underscore one and gut underscore two as files. Okay, so what we can do is actually use this similar, um, use a similar logic to um, what we've done previously using a, um, basically a wildcard, a glob pattern to identify more files as a part of params.reads. So what we will do is we will overwrite this in the command line. So we can use reads. So dash dash reads. Again, this is specifying the um, the reads parameters because the reads is a parameter, so params. Dot. We can go to the data folder, the GTL, and then the gut one two dot fq. So if we were to run this now, this would be exactly the same as running uh, what we're doing here. The only difference is, is that this has got the project um, directory at the start here, whether we just can use a relative path um, to where we are in the current directory, so it does this automatically. Um, but what I want to do is actually change this to include um, everything. So not just gut. So now we're not specifying that it has to be gut. It could be any of the other tissue types in the situation um, that have a underscore one dot fast queue at the end or an underscore two dot fast queue. And what we should find is that this will populate for the gut, liver, and lung. So this, this wildcard allows us to use any of the three tissue types, um, because it's managed to identify all three of these in here, it's found this, this almost like base name being the tissue type and the two files that are associated. It. So it has created file pairs um, from the files that were um, available in that folder and fit this pattern. Uh, in this case up here, it was just gut. Down here by writing the command line, it was any of the tissues because we had that wild card in the pattern. Um, just as easily, if say you just wanted to run it on the liver, um, you could easily just override it with that. Okay, so to move things along, um, there are a couple of exercises here under 3.3.1. Um, the first of which is to use the set operator. So set um, operates in a very similar way to the actual equal sign that we use here to name our output channel. In this case, what I will do is I'm going to copy this, get rid of that. We can move this down like this and add in dot set and then add in some squiggly brackets for the read pairs dot channel. Um, so this is the name I want to set the output channel to. And then we can just add in a line there to help with readability. So we've got this channel, uh, this channel factory from file pairs. We're still taking the params.reads, but instead of using an equal sign to set the output channel name, uh, we're just going to use set for read underscore pairs underscore channel. Um, and we can run this again and see what the output looks like. Fantastic, so that's still running, we've still got liver um, and the two file pairs that we've created as a part of that from file pairs channel. Um, the only difference here is that we've used dot set rather than equal sign. Something else that you can do um, with something like a channel factory is actually add in some additional options. So this is an additional exercise here under 3.3.1. Um, in this case, we're adding in this check of exist option. So it's actually going to check if these file pairs exist. Um, and if it does, the pipeline will continue. If it doesn't, it will fail and probably spit back a bit of an error message. Um, so this, this is just a way to check that the file exists um, as suggested by the name. Um, you can go and look at the documentation for this online. Um, but again, if you just run that again, nothing else will really change apart from it's actually checked if that file um, has exist, exists. And if it didn't, um, it would kill the pipeline um, because it wasn't there to execute. Okay, so um, we will keep moving on um, just because I am conscious of time. So again, we're still on the NF training uh, folder. Um, we have a work folder, which is full of different um, processes that have been executed or the, ooh, um, 
Actually, you can't see that because nothing has been um, put in there. RM.RF, we're just going to clear that anyway. Um, so we're all good. We've got a nice clean directory again and a nice clean terminal so you can, everyone can see what's going on. Jumping down to script four, so I've just opened up script four. And what you can see is we've, we've jumped back to building our main pipeline. So we've, we've still got our um, parameters up the top, our log info, we've got process um, index, and now we have process quantification. So quantification is another process that we have um, created or added in here. We have, again, an input, an output, and a script. For the input, we have two different inputs. So these are two positional inputs. We have, the first one is path, which is going to be the salmon index, and the second is this tuple. So a tuple is a way that you can um, have different elements as a part of the same channel. So the first part is a value, which we've called sample ID, and the second is a path, which is two reads. Um, again, value and paths are just ways that we um, can specify the different data types, and this will be expanded upon as a um, later part of the training. So here we have um, the output as well, which is going to be a path to sample ID. In this case, um, sample ID is going to be the same as the value that we have supplied as an input. So this file is really good. It is really dynamic in that you can specify things. Um, you can reference things that come in from your input as an output, for example, um, as a variable. Down here in the script block, we have salmon quant. So salmon um, quant is another salmon tool. Um, we still have this threads with tasks.cpus, very similar to what we've done with the task CPUs uh, up here, or we've done previously up here in the index. Um, we have a lib type, um, we have a salmon index. So this is the input, salmon index. Um, we know that because it's got this dollar sign at the front. We've got a minus one for read one and a minus two for read two. And we have these indexed reads which are specified here as a part of the second part of this tuple, which is a path. Uh, we have indexed the first and the second part of that list. And then we have the sample ID as the output, um, which is a named uh, variable, which we have up here as the value. So this is going to give the output name sample ID, um, which will be taken as an input here as a part of this tuple. That's all quite uh, complicated and probably a little bit um, hard to digest. So I think the easiest thing to do is just um, start to run this and then look at the outputs and then we can go back and uh, look at the workflow block. So next I run script4.nf, hit enter. And this will run. So as you can see, um, index is running, and then we have quantification running. Um, and both of those ran successfully. Okay, so what has happened here? First of all, we have um, in this workflow block, this channel factory. So this is exactly what we've just looked at as a part of script three. We've got from the file pairs, we've got params.reads, we've checked if it's true, and we've set the output to read underscore pairs underscore ch. Here for the index.ch, index underscore ch, my apologies, um, we have the index process, which has taken the params.transcriptome.file um, as processed that and created this index underscore um, ch channel as the output. So again, this is that salmon uh, index folder, which we um, specify up here as the output. What we see down here is the quantification process, and it is taking two positional arguments. So the first one is index, and we know this is going to be represented by this one because it's in the first position. And here we have read pairs underscore ch, uh, read underscore pairs underscore ch, um, which is a tuple, which has uh, the first part is a value, which is sample ID, and the second part is path, which is to the reads. It has taken the read pairs um, channel, which we created using this um, channel factory up here, and then there's also taken this index underscore ch, which is the output of this index process. So what has happened here is that we've taken an input from this channel factory, but also our previous process. So we've had two different channels being supplied to this process, 
and then quantification, the process, has acted upon those and created a channel called quant underscore ch. If we actually wanted to view the contents of that, we could go and look at the, the work directory. Um, or we can use the published directory, which is something we'll explore very shortly. But first of all, what I wanted to do is show you some extra functionality of this resume. And this is something I talked about previously, is that if you were to use resume on this, but you're using resume because you've found that you've actually got some more samples, for example, um, and you want to include those as a part of your pipeline. What we can do is add in something like this. Then we're going to add that wildcard back in here. So uh, we're going to run script four again. We're going to resume, but we're changing the reads. We're overriding the reads par parameter from the command line, and we're going to include everything as a part of this. This um, everything that specifies this um, wildcard pattern in, in this folder. Okay, so that's all executing again. That's all um, good. But as you can see, um, up here, we've got this cached one. And down here, for quantification is actually run three times now, not just one as was here. We only specified gut because we've changed this to the wildcard. It will pick up the liver and lung as well. And it's been executed three times, but one of those was cached. If you were to run this again, uh, what you'll find is that this cached will become three. Yep, so um, the difference here is that this is cache one and this is cache three. So next slide identified that um, this has been run once before um, up here, and here it identified they've been run three times. So I didn't have to recompute everything, it could just allocate um, or could just detect that it had been run and then just sort of push straight on to the results. Under 3.4.1, we have a couple of new uh, exercises. The first is adding a tag. So a tag is another type of directive that can be used to help. Um, sort of manage your processes. In this case, we are going to add it to the quantification. So um, a tag is quite simple. You specify tag. Um, in this case, we're going to say salmon on sample ID. So again, this is dynamic. It's picked it up from uh, the value here, which is included as a part of this input tuple. And if you were to rerun that again, um, I'm going to run this with ANSI log false. Um, so you can see each process or each task um, for each process. So again, this is going to split their quantification out um, into three separate lines so they don't just sort of stack on top of each other where we can't see them. So what you can see here is we've got this tag, um, salmon on liver, salmon on lung, and salmon on gut. So um, we can tell exactly what each of these processes were and what's inside those folders um, if we were to go and look at them because we've got this tag here. Um, which is quite a nice way of just um, keeping track of what's happening in your pipeline. As well as that, you can also add additional directives such as published directory. So this is quite a useful one to know about because this is how you can specify where you want result files to be stored. At the moment, everything is happening within the work directory, but we haven't actually um, told the pipeline where to put this as an output. So I've just copied this straight out of the uh, exercise material. We have this published er, which again is another directive. Um, we've got params.outdir, which we've specified up here. We've called this folder results, or we, we will call this results. Um, and down here, uh, all this is saying is just mode copy. This is another option, much like we've used the um, options in the past to check that a file exists, check if it exists true here. Um, so again, it's just another, another option. Okay, uh, so what I'm going to do is just clear uh, my work directory just to show that there's nothing there, and then we will run this. So again, this is script four. Uh, we'll use ANSI log equals false. Cool, so we see index run once and quantification run three times, three separate lines uh, for the liver, gut, and lung. What you will now see, though, is that we have this results folder, and this is new. If you look inside that, you will see the sample IDs. So this is the same as what uh, is here. This is the sample ID. This is what we got from the channel factory as that sort of common base name. 
and we've created a separate folder for each of these. Um, and inside those, there's a lot of information about the actual quantification, which is generated using the salmon quant. So um, just to summarize that, we'll say it in a slightly different way to hopefully uh, make it more digestible, um, if what I've already said hasn't made sense, um, is that we've used this published error directive to tell Nextflow where the output files should be stored, in this case in params.out. Out there, um, we want it to copy the files there, um, and the params type, uh, the file, excuse me, the files are um, getting put into this out there here, which is results, and we can see that um, when we look at that, or when we look at our file directory. Um, we can also look at it over here, wherever it may be. Here, yeah, results, gut, liver, and lung. Cool. Okay. Um, so that is really the end of script and we're going to jump on to script 5. So again we're moving from script 4 to script 5. This script is in massively different, excuse me, different apart from we've added um, another process. In this case it's called FastQC. Uh, FastQC has a tag, it's taking uh, the tuple um, value with a sample ID and the path to reads. Uh, it's got an output which is just um, an output to this, this logs folder. Um, down here in the script block, we're making a directory called fastqc underscore with a sample ID. Again, this is dynamically um, inferred from the input. Um, we're running fastqc on it. Fastqc is installed as a part of that Docker image as well, which is why this will run. So um, if you were to run this, um, this should all work. What you will see down here is we also have this fastqc um, as a part of the workflow. So this is the process name and it is taking in read pairs underscore channel. So this is the same name that we have set from our channel factory. So this is taking from file pairs. So again, it'll have that base name at the start, either gut, liver, or lung, as well as the two uh, files listed as the second part of, or the second element. Um, this is really just to demonstrate that you can reuse a channel. So you can see here that we have um, read pairs channel, we have the first one here, which is used as part of quantification, and then we use it again here as a part of the fast QC. Um, so what, what we're really trying to do here is start to build up this idea that um, you can use these Chinet channels in dynamic ways, and that you can sort of share them or reuse them between different processes, um, depending on what you're trying to do. So um, I'll just run this again. Uh, well, I'll just clear all of this, and then we will um, go next flow, run, script5.nf. So again, what we should see here is that this will um, run. In this case, because I haven't um, changed the, we removed the gut here or overridden it in the command line to a wildcard, um, this will only run for the gut samples. And we can see it running uh, each, each process once. If you were to override this, obviously, um, I'm just going to override it up here for this example by adding in the wildcard. Um, so I'm not really overriding, I'm just editing the script. Um, if you were to run this again, um, what you will see is that this will run um, once for index and then three times for quantification and fast QC um, because we have files being passed through from that channel factory for each of the three tissue types. Okay, fantastic. Um, there's not a lot else to really explain about this. Um, so let's just jump on to script six. Here for script six, um, we've added a new process again. This time it's called multi QC. So um, up here on line 68, you'll see process multi QC. Um, we have a published directory, which um, is that directive that we introduced earlier. So params.out der. Um, and we're going to use the copy mode as well. Um, of course, you can, like I said, you can read more about this um, in the documentation. For input, we're just taking everything. So this is that wildcard. Um, so everything that is staged in this work directory, staging is a concept um, that we'll discuss uh, more as a part of uh, session three. But for now, um, everything that has been put into that work directory um, that has been allocated as an input will be passed into that process as an input, um, will be detected because it's, it's just detecting everything. And then the output, it's going to have this multi-QC report um, HTML. The script being run is just this, this simple multi-QC dot. So just everything in the current directory will be um, sort of included. 
what you'll see down here is a part of the, the workflow block down here when we actually run multi-QC, you'll see these two new operators. The first is mix and the second is collect. So this mix operator is mixing the quant channel with the fast QC channel. So what is happening is you have the quant channel, which is specified up here from the, um, the output of the quantification process, and you have the fast QC channel, which is the output of fast QC process. They are being mixed together. So they are all being kind of put into the same place. And then the collect operator is merging all of those into one element. So before we actually look at this, I think what we should do is just look at some of this using a view operator. So again, the view operator is to uh, the IEW is to print the channel. So print uh, what is being passed around in um, that particular channel uh, between the processes. So here we're launching uh, script six. This is all running. Um, index quantification fast QC is all running once because we have um, we didn't specify the full um, full wildcard setting. Um, but I think it's actually better if we do do that. So I'm going to go back up here and add that in. Just going to save that, and then I'm just going to run this again with resume. So this should be a little bit quicker because index and quantification should be cached, um, or at least some of it. And then for the quantification in FastQC for the liver and lung tissue, they don't need to run again. So um, this is the channel that we have viewed. So this is the quant channel mixed with the FastQC channel and everything being collected into uh, the one element. What this would look like if we removed dot collect is quite different. So again, you are still mixing these two channels together. That's why you can see the outputs of these two channels using the same view operator. But here you'll see that they're printed on separate lines, meaning that they'd be pushed through um, as separate tasks. Thinking of this a slightly different way again, um, potentially something that is more um, visual or tangible as well. If you were to run it like this, so this is the original script. Um, I'm just going to run this again. So I can use all that cached. Multi-QC is getting run once, which is great. But if you were to remove this collect and run it again, so we've removed the collect Operator, um, as we showed before, this splits or it doesn't collect everything, meaning that it'll be pushed through as separate um, tasks. You'll see it's run six times. So the multi-QC process, because it's all separate channels, um, it's all it's going to be pushed through as task, 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 um, six times. Okay, um, so that's really just a demonstration that with um, the right operators, you can manipulate the way your channels are shaped and merge files and the sort of move them around in a way that you can um, get files into the right place at the right time um, and sort of use, um, you know, use your channels and processes in a dynamic way, meaning that you can really sort of fine tune the way everything is run um, and make sure that everything is passed to the right process um, in, a, in an appropriate way. Okay, so the final script is script seven, um, and this one is um, reasonably straightforward. The only difference that we have here is this workflow on complete, which again, we have this log info. So this is the same as what we've got up here. Um, but in this case, when the workflow is successful, um, it will either print a successful message telling us where the multi-QC report was stored. Um, again, if you're from outside bioinformatics, the multi-QC report is just a, um, it's a place where you can kind of collect all of your QC data and view it in a really nice, um, really nice viewer on the web. Um, and if it's failed, then it will just tell you, oops, something's gone wrong. So um, you could just run this again. Resume is probably not overly useful, but um, what I just wanted to show is that, um, you know, processes and NetFlow um, 
can sort of all happen um you know say synchronous all these things kind of like push through and as it's available it's first and first out um, but you can also use this workflow on complete so that once the entire workflow is finished um, you can sort of sort of back end it by using something like um, you know workflow on complete which will mean that it's only executed once everything is finished um, in this case it's just told us where um, you know it's been successful and that we can um, open this uh, file if we want to Okay, so we're running out of time here, so I will just sort of move through the last bits quite quickly. Um, 3.8 of the training material is email notifications. Uh, we can't really set that up too well as a part of the Gitpod environment, but um, it's an example that you could also have like a, an email to say this run was successful, here's your report sent to you after this workflow had finished. 3.9 is quite interesting, actually. It's an example of a custom script. So... As kind of already alluded to, um, Nextflow um, is quite interoperable. You can allow lots of different scripting languages and different scripting blocks. Um, and like I said, you can have Python, R, Perl, uh, Bash, like whatever. Um, as long as it runs on Linux, you could you could include it as a part of um, include it as part of your Nextflow pipeline. So what I will do is I am going to code fastqc.sh. So I'm going to create a fastqc um, shell script. I am going to copy in the code from the, from the training material. Um, so all this is doing is saying, um, use this as a bash script, use positional arguments, um, create sample ID and reads and feed those into the fast QC um, tool, um, like we do in our main script block. I am just going to close that and then copy in some code to make that executable. Oh. Um, so here, for example, I'm just making that fast QC executable. Um, I've made a directory called bin, which is up here now. Um, and I'm going to move this fast QC.sh, which is still here, into that bin. Click execute. Um, so you'll see now that we have a bin directory. Inside that bin directory, we have um, this fast QC.sh, and it is executable. Well, what we can do now is modify our script 7. So this is the script uh, that we finished off on with the workflow on complete. But instead of having this make directory and fastqc process, uh, this fastqc tool run in here like this, we can just execute our script, which is in our bin directory. So Nextflow will automatically uh, mount the bin, I guess is probably one way to describe it, so that when you execute your pipeline, it'll be automatically there, and any scripts you have in your bin um, will be available for you to execute. So what I'll do is next flow run script 7.nf, and we will run this again. So remembering that I have modified the script, um, so it will look a little bit different to previous runs. So it is a little bit different to previous runs, excuse me. Um, so again, it's going to run NextFlow version 22.04. It's been given a name. That's all the long info that we asked it to print. And then we have the index the quantification. And now we're running fastqc on gut, but it is actually running this fastqc.sh, which is a shell script, which we created in here and made executable so that it could be run um, by NextFlow automatically. Down here is just that on complete statement that we asked for. Okay, so um, all we've done there is just added this in. Uh, we added in the shell script and the bin folder. Um, like I said, just to demonstrate that we can uh, sort of include custom scripts in a situation like this and put them in the bin and then next time I'll be able to detect them and run them um, automatically. Something we can also do, which is quite nifty, is we can add in some extra reports um, or we can capture some extra reports um, generated by the pipeline. So um, this is just some code that I've copied out of the training material as well. So with report, with trace, with timeline, with DAG, which we've called DAG.png. We will just run this again. I probably could have re used resume here to speed things up. Um, but what this will do is we'll create a report, a trace, a timeline, um, and a DAG, uh, which will populate over here in my explorer.
So a lot of this stuff can be quite nice as well, um, just to help sort of um, keep an eye on your timeline. Um, this is an HTML, which doesn't render too well here, but I think we can click on the DAG and we should get a nice image. Yeah, so this is just a representation of, of um, our pipeline, um, all working together with the different processes there in circles. Um, we've got the channel factory up here, as well as some of the operators in here showing how these channels are kind of um, manipulated to be passed from one process to another. Okay, so the last thing we have as a part of today's training is something that we will explore um, in more detail tomorrow, is running our code directly from GitHub. So what Nextflow will do is, because of this inbuilt version control, is that you can effectively pull your pipeline directly from GitHub or another GitHub repository. So in this situation, Nextflow-io, this is a GitHub repository. Um, you can go to GitHub and find this. And we're going to use Docker, and we can run this. And instead of having this locally, this doesn't exist anywhere here. What it is doing is it's going away to github.com, nextflow-io, backslash RNA seq, um, and it's pulling this in. Uh, there does appear to be an error as a part of this. I'm not sure why that's there, but what I'm going to do is just try a different version. Um, using this minus R it helps um, version control, so we can refer to a different version. Um, so I'm going to use the revision dev, um, which is the development line. And hopefully this one is working. Uh, okay, so this is probably the issue here is that it's still running, um, well, it's potentially still running DSL1, um, which won't always run on the newer versions of Nextflow now. Um, so we should update this example, but for now, um, it does appear to be running. It does have slightly different code here. Um, if you went to this repository, uh, here, for example, that open automatically. Ah, oh, yes, awesome. Um, so this is a repository here. This master branch wasn't working. Um, it'll default to master, so I use this dev branch, um, which is still DSL one. Um, it hasn't been updated in some time, so that that explains that one. Okay. Um, so believe it or not, that still ran despite being at least six years old, which is pretty cool. Um, it had all of the tools and, and images available, so I could just pull that straight from GitHub. Um, if anything, it's really showing that, um, you know, if you write your pipeline in a, in, a, in a good way with all the containers and things available on, on a repository, um, even years and years and years later, uh, your pipeline is still executable um, by pulling it directly from GitHub, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I think that's where we will finish today. This gets us to the end of section three. Tomorrow for session two, we will actually be diverting away from this training material and we'll be talking about NF Core in more detail. So for that, uh, we'll use a slightly different training environment and we'll really explore the different tools and documentation that's available as a part of NF Core. So uh, with that, I'd really like to thank everyone for attending today. Hopefully you will manage to learn something um, and put up with me uh, sort of mumbling my way through. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. So thanks very much.